This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. On December 16th, the core team of Monero announced to the community changes of responsibility that are expected to better streamline developments of the Monero codebase. Most notably, they announced Ricardo Spagni, aka Fluffy Pony, will be stepping down as the lead maintainer of Monero, and that a Monero contributor known as Snipa will be taking his place. Fluffy Pony will continue as a backup maintainer to relieve Snipa during times when he's busy or on vacation. On last week's episode, I spoke with Ricardo. He told us why this transition indicates that the Monero project has matured and is becoming more decentralized. This week, I spoke with Snipa, whose real name is Alexander Blair. He tells us why he loves Monero and how he became the new lead maintainer. We learn that while Snipa is not yet well known by the general Monero community, he's not trying to maintain his anonymity. He seems willing and very able to interact with the community publicly. After talking with him, my feeling is Snipa is the right man for the job. He seems to have a real understanding of what needs to be done to streamline development and the experience and drive to do it. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Alex. Hi. AKA Sniper. Thanks for coming on the show. Absolutely. Glad to be here. So um, obviously Monero is all about privacy. Um, you know, we're all about, ma- you know, maintaining, pe- helping people maintain their privacy. Um, I know uh, you're not the, the most public character. So I guess my, my first question is who, who is uh, Sniper? I don't want to, I don't want to cross any lines here. I don't want to, you know, uh, expose you in any way, but uh, if you're willing to talk about it. Sure. Or maybe you so, already are uh, exposed. To what degree are, do people know about you? Um, to a fair extent. Uh, I've been fairly public on my GitHub for a while now. Uh, I joined, started working on Monero a couple of years ago, uh, particularly around the pool environment, which is where you find me most of the time. Uh, in particular, there was a kind of a desire for another type of pool, uh, PPLNS, if you're familiar kind of with the mining system. Uh, all the old mining pools were proportional based. Uh, and so somebody kind of challenged me to write another pool. Uh, and that's where I kind of came into it. I had previously been doing some mining. Um, I've been working in tech for the last 12 years, my entire professional career. Uh, and so this was kind of a natural transition for me, uh, going from a hardcore sysadmin out into mining and software development uh, and kind of helping the project through that. All right. So you're so. a fairly public figure for somebody that's in Monero. Yeah, actually, the uh, my last company, I was the CTO of a crypto company. And so it's actually not too hard to find much about me. Okay. Well, so, yeah, what is, uh, I guess that that's a good good first question. What, what, is, what is your background? What's your kind of your day so job? So prim- primarily system administration. Um, I was a system administrator for about six years straight. Uh, all Linux, very depth, in-depth and Debian and Ubuntu, things like that. Um, kind of transitioned into more of a software development role after that. Uh, which is what gave me the backing to go work on the pools. Uh, these days, I'm working for a small social media company. Uh, for my last position was the CTO slash co-founder of a Ethereum auditing company um, that did Ethereum contract auditing. Uh, and so we wrote a large number of tools and did in-depth investigations into the Ethereum EVM. And so crypto, like most people, started as kind of a, a hobby on the side? Uh, to a little bit of an extent. Uh, I toyed with Bitcoin many, many years ago. Um, never really did much with it, kind of let it taper off. Work, work was more important back then. Um, crypto definitely became more of a hobby and kind of a primary about two years ago when I started doing the pool work. Um, kind of wanted to fill that, help fill that gap. So, and so is, is there, is there a passion? Obviously, I'm assuming there's a passion there oh, yeah. for, for yeah, the technology. I, I quite enjoy it. I enjoy the ideas that cryptocurrency brings to the table. Um, I don't agree with all the uses that people always want for it because everyone's like, oh, it's going to change the world. 
no, it's not necessarily going to change the world. It is a very useful tool, and it could be used to change the world. But like I said, I worked on the Ethereum EVM for a while, so I saw a lot of, hey, I'm going to create a coin to do X, Y, or Z. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's kind of neat to see the ERC-20 tokens and how those things are used. I love Monero because I love that Monero acts like cash. And that's one of the things that I love about it. I love that it's private. I love that it's really secure. I love that Monero puts real effort into building a better coin. So how did you find yourself? What is then your Monero story? How did you arrive at Monero? So I, I, so, I obviously agree with you. I, I On this show, we always talk about how Monero is uh, the closest thing we have to true digital cash. But what was your, uh, your path to so Monero? I, uh, like I said, I was a sysadmin for for many years, um, and I was doing a contract position where we had a bunch of servers with extra CPU. Uh, and so back on CN0, back in the original crypto note mining, uh, back when CPUs were great before ASICs rolled out, uh, I was running uh, five or 600 servers uh, that we just had down CPU cycles on. And so I was mining with those, and that's where I got started. And that's how you discovered the Monero, the technology? Monero, kind of going into the idea of like, hey, I have a bunch of CPUs with idle time. What can I do with them? I already liked cryptocurrency in general. Uh, Monero was a very obvious choice back then because this was before even GPU mines were a big thing. Right. Okay. So now, now that you're now that you're here, you arrived. Do you do you look at other coins? Do you look at other projects? Or are you kind of strictly a Monero guy? I mean, it's always good to look at other projects, right? There's no, there's no one right coin for everything. Um, you have other privacy coins that I don't like as much. They're not private by default or whatever. Maybe they're flaw in my eyes. Um, but I think they have good ideas. Uh, and so I think it's, I think it would be insane not to, particularly as lead maintainer, to be looking at these other coins to see what else is going on in the world out there. Monero is not perfect. We all know that. There's definitely going to be problems at some point. But looking at how other uh, coins are solving some of those similar problems could be very valuable later for all of us. Yeah, well, let's get into that a little bit. What would you say or what do you think uh, Monero's biggest flaws are or areas that could use improvement? What, what are things that kind of keep you up at night about Monero? Um, there's not a whole lot. I mean, I certainly these days I do run a very large pool um, with M5M 400. Uh, we run a support XMR. Uh, and so we run into a lot of kind of interesting use cases of Monero, right? So we, we do a lot of back-end work on it. Uh, we run 55 Monero daemons now. Uh, and so we get exposed to a lot of kind of interesting corner cases. Uh, and some of our biggest stuff is that the Monero blockchain sometimes has issues with reorgs. We'll lose entire daemons. Uh, like a daemon will literally just stop updating because it gets stuck on a reorg. Um, and so stuff like that is the biggest concern that I kind of have because that slows down adoption. Um, services that rely on the daemon, um, your wallets, your exchanges, they rely on the daemons to be accurate. If the daemons have issues, that's problematic. Um, certainly, we run a lot of daemons, and so we see a lot more of these types of issues. Uh, but thankfully, they're usually pretty easy to resolve. So do you see that improving as, as we move forward? I'd, I'd like to see that improve, certainly. Uh, I know that we still have a lot of general features that we're trying to get implemented and stuff like that. Um, I know that we still have a lot of research going on under Ring CT and bulletproof, uh, bulletproofs in general. Um, so I know that all that work's being done. The daemon has gotten more stable over the last, what, three major releases. Uh, I think we've dropped from losing a daemon every day or two to maybe losing one once a week. Um, and so that's a big improvement on our side. Which means, I mean, for a normal user, you're talking maybe once a year you have a daemon issue, which is actually not bad, right? Because once a year is a hard fork. So it's not as much of a concern. We just happen to, like I said, when you got 50 daemons, one going down a week tells us once every once every 50 weeks, the daemon has to restart it. So how, how did you get selected as the new uh, lead maintainer? Was there, was there kind of a process there among, uh, did it just uh, I got, uh, naturally happen? That, I got recommended in, um, and I was brought in to see if I was willing to take on the position and kind of help guide the project. Um, I have, like I said, extensive software development experience. Um, I've done a lot of work in uh, open source software, like I said, run a big pool, uh, and still do some work with that. Uh, and so it was kind of a, hey, you have the skills, you have the availability to do it, um, and are you interested? And of course, I love Monero, so absolutely. Now, now Fluffy has uh, described this as being an indication 
that Monero is growing up and is becoming more decentralized now that he's able to pass it on to somebody uh, somebody else. Do you agree with that that notion? Uh, I certainly tend to agree with that, definitely from the perspective of, hey, in software development and programming, like I said, I was a CTO. I'm used to the bus problem. Like, if somebody gets hit with a bus, what is the recovery solution? Um, I'm not the only maintainer on the project. There are still other people that can maintain the code base, including Fluffy. Um, but no longer are we kind of pinned to one or two key people um, that really do a lot of things. Part of that is definitely more than just lead maintainer, right? He's handing off binary signing. He's handing off um, some of the control of the general fund. Like, all of those things that were in the document are things that Fluffy's taking out. Fluffy is looking to get off of his plate and people in the community are stepping up too, which means now we're getting a more decentralized, a more, in t- uh, more secure infrastructure to support Monero and from a development standpoint. For those of us that are a little less technical, how would you describe the role of lead maintainer? What is uh, it involved? It's really, honestly, mostly paperwork. Um, lead maintainer, the biggest thing that I deal with is reviewing inbound code changes to make sure that they're not going to be malicious um, and that they kind of achieve what they're looking for. Uh, part of that is dealing with the fact that when a release needs to go out, it is part of my job to make sure the release is ready on time. Um, there's definitely been cases where people have been busy and releases have been late. Uh, and so people haven't had a large period of time to upgrade into a stable release version. So from a pool operator side, that's always been a little troubling for us because we have to, right at the time of fork, everything has to go correctly or the network essentially shuts down, right? Because as a pool operator, if the pool is shut down, mining stops. If mining stops, the network stops, which is very problematic from as a pool operator and as a as lead maintainer to think that, hey, if I'm late on something, the network literally stops. Okay, so th- this is starting to make more sense to me as to why somebody like yourself uh, would be great for the job, because you, yeah, you, it's, it's, you understand it's, the real world repercussions of of making what what happens when something goes wrong. Yeah, we we do a lot of I've done a lot of research into that in the past. Um, certainly with stuff like understanding how does the network flow um, and what does it take for for example a block to move across the world, right? Because from a user's perspective, a block is a block. Well, from the perspective of the network, a block is only exist in the daemons that have accepted it. And so even understanding like, hey, a block found in Asia may take a minute to get over to the America. Like that's a big slowdown. There's things like that. Um, Bitcoin ran into this years ago. Uh, and so they have a very high speed network for these types of things. And certainly as lead maintainer, I'm interested in where those types of things may come in to support us in the future, because I think that's critical to adoption. Being able to reliably and accurately, more importantly, quickly verify transactions and verify what's going on in the network will help the network grow. Now, what's involved in the actual handoff? I think even uh, before we we jumped on, you said you were, uh, because we had some technical issues with Skype, and then you said you've been dealing with a lot of technical issues in general. Uh, with the GUI builds, so what what yeah. what is involved uh, with the handoff? Uh, the biggest stuff is the uh, essentially transference of trust, um, and that's really the big thing here. Um, over the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, locking down various email accounts. I've been locking down various my GitHub account, uh, two-factor auth, all the kind of boring stuff that comes with everyone going, "Hey, you should secure your stuff," and this is why. Um, a part a big part of this is getting my GPG key signed. Um, and getting my GPG keys verified by multiple people. Uh, so far, Monero, Moo, Fluffy, uh, and just today, uh, Jonathan verified my GPG key, have all verified my GPG key separately and have added comments to the GitHub issue to say, hey, Alex owns this GPG key. Uh, because when I start signing binaries and things like that, it's important for our user base to be able to rely on the fact that my GPG key is actually mine. How about that, that recent hack that we saw a few weeks ago? Um, uh, when the server was compromised. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm from a system administrator, from a system administrator standpoint, I don't have anything that isn't public knowledge and I'll just be really upfront about that. Um, it's interesting for me because certainly, uh, our pool had issues with that in the past too. Um, ours happened to be an internal compromise that we were able to uh, locate. Uh, one of our server hosts actually compromised our box, uh, did a really poor job of it, but way too easy to detect. Um, uh, but It's definitely interesting kind of from the standpoint of like, hey, this is why we publish hashes. This is why we GPG sign things. Um, 
the kind of thing you always hear is like, hey, GPG signing verification and hashing is hard. Um, and I don't know how to solve that because for me, it's something I've done for years. Um, so I'm very used to the process, but I know that it is something that can be improved upon for our user base um, to deal with the uh, uh, fallout of that hack. I mean, it was only detected when somebody went, hey, these hashes don't match. This is a problem. Uh, and I believe that was a failing of the team. But with how busy the team is, I six and one half does the other, right? They have to get the releases out, but building tools to detect compromises like that takes time. So when I introed you, we kind of joked about the fact that uh, you're, you know, you're you're kind of anonymous, but you're not. You're actually not. You're actually quite well known. Um, but there are a lot of uh, developers that are fully anonymous, completely anonymous in Monero, which I think is a great thing, right? Um, what's your opinion there? Do you think uh, Monero has a robust development network that's decentralized enough that would uh, be able to sustain some kind of an attack? Uh, I mean, what's kind of interesting about that is that's kind of what the lead maintainer role helps deal with, right? Um, because the people that write the code are not allowed to commit directly to the code base and they can't get a release out, it is my job to make sure if one of them gets compromised that their code gets caught early, right? And so that's a big part of that. Um, and it's one of the things where it's more than just a role where you bring someone in just to file the paperwork. They have to be able to read the code. They have to be able to look it over. They have to be able to say, hey, this looks weird. Why was this done like this? Um, I think that we could use more developers. I think more knowledge developers are great. Um, it definitely adds more work to the maintainer role to deal with more developers and to deal with the um, relationships between all the developers because we have really strong core developers on the team. Monero Mu is a fantastic developer. He's been writing code for years and it's great. Uh, and I'd love to see more people kind of step in, step in and do take over some of the tickets that are just sitting, sitting on the project. Um, but it's also a very complex code base. Uh, I've done small re-implementations of portions of the code base in other languages, and it takes a long time to do because it's a complex piece of software. Like, there's no getting around that. Do you think um, it Monero has a robust development community? Are there are there a lot of people? Would you say there's a lot of people working on the code compared to to other projects? I mean, it depends on what you compare it to, right? Uh, because there's a lot of really large open source projects that are two or three developers. Um, OpenSSL, classically, if you remember the OpenSSL compromises over the last couple of years, Heartbleed and stuff like that, it came out that there's only two or three developers working on these projects, right? And so certainly I, we have more contributors than that, which is nice. Uh, but does that make us a large, robust project? I don't know the answer to that. Um, in my opinion, more developers is usually better uh, because it's more more people, more more people looking at it, more people understanding what's going on. Um, in software development, we have the idea of tribal knowledge, right? That's the idea that knowledge is built up over time and is handed off from person to person. The more people that have the ability to hand off the knowledge that's being gained, the better for the project in my mind. What are you particularly excited about in Monero right now? Is there anything in particular that kind of excites you in terms of the technology and where we're at? Uh, overall, I'm actually really excited that you saw, I don't know if you saw that Coinbase is doing some announcements that, hey, they think it's going to be the year of the privacy coin. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all their views, uh, but it's kind of interesting to see that privacy coins have been more and more of a thing of your discussion across a large number of exchanges. Um, Unfortunately, it's just kind of the way it goes, right? I accept that I would love to use Monero for all my daily charges everywhere. I also completely understand that there has to be a way to go between fiat and Monero for now um, until there's essentially an entire chain from top to bottom where you can start with a raw material and have a finished good and then buy that finished good with Monero. Someone has to be ready, willing to do the effort of going through and getting fiat out because eventually you're handing off money for it. Um, I'd love to see that change. I'd love to see us have this entire economy built around Monero because I think you're, it's digital cash. And I love that. And I love the fact that if I hand you 100 Monero, nobody can tell how much I handed you, but you and I can both independently verify the money was transferred. I think that's great. I love that. I also understand that it's going to be very hard for us as a community to get to the point where that's just a thing that everybody does. Yeah, that the the Brian Armstrong article was is interesting. Um, 
So he's, yeah, I guess talking about uh, this decade kind of being potentially the decade uh, of privacy coins where, where people start to onboard and mainstream people start to use it. But he doesn't mention the M word at all. What, what do you think's up with that? With, uh, you know, people that are in the know, big, na- big names like this, uh, but they fail to mention the largest uh, privacy coin project in the space. To be fair, I mean, these are people that represent their companies, right? Uh, and so there's limits to what they can and can't say. I mean, we have the term uh, a forward looking statement from the from the SEC, right? Like you can't provide something that's a forward looking statement. Keep in mind that big companies are regulated for a reason. Uh, Coinbase is a regulated company. If they actively say a coin that they would be interested in holding, that's a forward that could be construed as a forward looking statement. Uh, and so you can't. There's things that they can and can't say, even if they really really want to. You can't say like, hey, we're going to be listening to this coin or this coin's interesting, Um, which I completely understand. It sucks because it would be really interesting to hear, hey, we want to support this coin. Um, But I also understand that, hey, there's loss around this. Do you have any opinion as to why Coinbase hasn't even listed it, but it's listed other projects? Uh, Not other privacy projects. I mean, that's kind of their their shtick, right? They can choose who and what to list. Um, in some ways it may be good and I don't know that Monero isn't listed, right? Because it does help reduce some of the scrutiny. Um, at the same time, it would be really nice to have a convenient fiat exchange. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So, um, obviously you know, you know a lot about mining as well. Um, so do you, I'm sure you must have a strong opinion on random X. So were you, were you pro random X going, going into, uh, this network upgrade or what was, what was your um, take on that? I've been kind of undecided the entire time. Um, random X is a very interesting hashing algorithm to say the least. Um, it's not impossibly hard to understand, but it does take a fair amount of time. Um, the crypto note series of algorithms that we've used for a long time are been relatively simple um, and pretty easy for someone just to kind of pick up and grab, re-implement, and understand. Um, the new Random X series is definitely a lot more complex. And so that's kind of where I'm torn on it. Um, the complexity lends itself to ASIC resistance. It lends itself to GPU resistance. It lends itself to the exact things that we wanted out of it as a community. Um, but I Well, do I guess that's my first of- question, though, is were you, because I, I think Fluffy even was kind of pro, uh, you know, let's, 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 bring in the ASICs, allow the ASICs right. to become commonplace as opposed to tr- trying to uh, thwart them. What was um, I mean, an opinion there? As a pool operator, and I mean, I, I have a couple of different sides of that one, right? Because as a pool operator, um, ASICs encourage centralization away from pools. Um, the kind of interesting thing about a pool and uh, the reason everyone always worries about like us, ha- us having 30, 40, 50% of the network is the possibility of a distributed attack, right? Um, where we could control block, block block generation and we could control chains and things like that, cause reorgs. I go back and forth on it. With an unknown ASIC, it's much easier to do while the ASIC's in development, right? And so if you have an ASIC and it provides you that kind of opportunity, um, it's very easy. And we saw this during CN0, the original crypto node implementation, um, that it was very possible for a mining pool to pick up a very large sum of hash due to it being an ASIC. Uh, Personally, I like the fact that miners that are smaller have a chance to do mining now. Um, With large GPU rigs becoming the norm, um, I certainly remember during CN1, CN2, um, there were people buying 500 to 1,000 GPUs at a time, right? And so they're building huge mining farms. That kind of takes away from the idea of a coin that is for the people, in my mind, um, and centralizes to the for the people who have the money, which is the same exact argument you get with an ASIC. So from that aspect, I really like the fact that RandomX is the thing and that it is so CPU heavy. Um, personally, I don't own any mining gear at this point. Um, I don't really have time for it, unfortunately, and nor the power draw. Uh, and I don't really want to deal with that much heat in this house, but... Um, I like the fact that we went towards random X. Uh, I, like I said, the only thing I don't like is how complex it is uh, because it's very difficult to understand kind of everything going on. Fair enough. Um, hmm. Let me see. What do, oh, what do you think of are maybe some of Monero's biggest challenges uh, moving forward? 
Uh, like I said, the biggest one I think that's going to be huge is adoption. Um, certainly, I think there's going to be competitors in the space, and I think it's definitely something to keep an eye out for and kind of keep an eye, uh, keep a watch on. Uh, but the biggest thing, I think, is trying to get to the point where vendors are ready to accept Monero directly uh, versus using services like XMR2 or some of the other kind of exchange-based services. Um, it, it's still easy to use Monero to buy things with Bitcoin if you're not in the United States, um, but it's not really in strengthening the cycle of the currency, right? You're just essentially using a third-party cutout to hit an exchange versus actually using Monero and keeping Monero cycling through the system. So that's definitely the biggest one. Um, I know that we're doing some technical stuff right now, like uh, figuring out rep repository layouts and stuff like that. Um, but that's just kind of maintenance stuff. Um, now that we're kind of trying to decide, like, hey, where do we want to keep the main copy of the repository? How do we deal with these kinds of things that we've never had to look at before? Um, certainly there's some security to be restored and faith to be restored with people after the hack. Um, and some of this is just going to be, hey, we're doing better. Nobody's perfect but we want to make sure this doesn't happen again. And so rebuilding that faith, I think is going to be a big thing over the next couple of weeks. Do you have um, kind of a, a big picture view of the crypto space and how you see things eventually working out? Are you kind of a guy where you see it's one coin to rule them all? Uh, there'll be one digital cash? Uh, there's, what's, no, what's your take there? th there's no one currency to rule them all, right? Um, certainly, even if you start looking into our sci-fi fantasy ideals of worlds, it's not one currency. There's always multiple currencies, no matter even if you have a like, completely centralized controlled government, there's still underground currencies. There's still other things like that. The idea that a single currency is going to be better than the rest is completely absurd to me. Um, there are going to be aspects of every currency that are better than others. Um, certainly, in some ways, you can consider the fact that Bitcoin is a transparent ledger where you can see how funds are flowing is actually a positive in a lot of use cases. It's not a positive in every use case, which is some of where Monero shows off, right? If I need to transfer, if I desire to transfer money in a private manner, I'm not going to use Bitcoin. I'll use Monero. But if I want to be able to have rapid acceptance of funds, Bitcoin's a lot easier. Like, certainly if Monero had identical acceptance, it wouldn't matter as much. But it is just kind of accepting the fact that, hey, no matter what we do, there's not going to be one currency that takes them all over. If you want to try to point that out, we still use gold. Right. Uh, even here in the U.S., there's still gold. You can still go buy things with gold. That is a possibility. It's not easy, kind of like using Monero. It's still possible to do, but it's not easy. All right. So, uh, I mean, you're obviously uh, very well spoken. You have obviously a, a, an amazing understanding of the technology. Why, why haven't we seen more of you in, in public, considering you're kind of already out there and known? Um, um, Will we see, be I seeing more of you? What's that? Yes. Uh, I do plan on attending the Monero conference uh, conference this year. Uh, I believe that they're discussing it in the, being in Berlin right now, I believe. Yes. Uh, and I do plan on attending, um, as well as just kind of some of the other stuff. Uh, a couple of years ago, I helped out with the Monero DEF CON Village uh, two years ago. Um, I was actually kind of the shipping point, so I've worked with the community before, and so the community did, the community organizers are more aware of me than just being out of the community. Um, certainly, I haven't tried to be out in the community much. Uh, I'm working on being on Reddit more and kind of being available. Uh, certainly, as I'm getting all my commit rights and stuff like that to the repositories, uh, I'll definitely be out a lot more and just kind of working with people to be like, hey, here's what's going on. Uh, the lead maintainer role is definitely a visible position in the community. Um, and Fluffy's done a great job of it over the years. And I'm really glad to see where he's taken it. And I'd like to keep going with that, where we do have a good public figure that has, hey, Monero has someone there. Do you see Monero as potentially becoming more of a full-time job for you? Uh, potentially. Uh, I don't think so right now. Uh, the maintainer position is not a paid position. It's definitely volunteer, as are most of the main positions in a good open source project. Um, the idea of it being a paid position is kind of an odd one in a lot of ways, um, mostly because really when you start looking at it, a paid position would be kind of a central centralization thing uh, because somebody still has to front, front the money, right? Even if it's the community fronting the money, there's still an organization arranging for that fundraising. And so it's kind of a tacit, hey, you're being paid even despite the community to do this work, which means, hey, we technically control your funding for that. Um, it's kind of convenient that I have a fair amount of time available to dedicate to Monero. 
Uh, and certainly my employer is aware of my working with Monero, um, and they're very, very much fine with that. So That makes a lot of sense. So it, it allows Ma- Monero to maintain its, its true open source. It's kind of decentralized nature. nature. Yep. All right. Well, thank you, Alex. Thanks for coming on. This is a great conversation. Uh, normally, the show is a little, little uh, longer, but we got through all the questions and you, you answered them thoroughly. I really appreciate it. Not a problem. Glad to, glad to have had a chance to come on. Yeah. Hope to talk to you again soon in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks. Good luck with everything. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also possible for contributions by viewers and listeners like you.